All right, chemistry, this is your video lecture for chapter two, section three, or at least part one of it anyway. We're going to be talking about using scientific measurements. And uh, we are going to take measurements, as, the, as we talked about in section two. But when we go to use that information, how do we use it? In this video lecture, uh, at least part one, your objectives are to distinguish between accuracy and precision in measurements because those are in normal conversation they're used pretty interchangeably but in science they have specific meanings and they're not the same and then determine the number of significant figures in a measurement all right there will be more objectives but that will be in part two of this video lecture so accuracy and precision to reduce the impact of error scientists repeat their measurements and calculations many times many times reproducibility uh, it is one of the key components of a well-constructed, well-executed uh, scientific uh, endeavor. If the, if the results are not consistent, they will try to identify and eliminate the source of that error. Think about it. If you're creating a study and you're doing calculations based on a specific thing, if you are doing it correctly, you should generate consistent results. For example, if I go... Um, to measure the length of a room, I, and I measure it three times. If I measure the length of the side of a room and it's 10 meters, one measurement, 12 meters, another measurement, and then 8 meters on my third measurement, that's an inconsistent measuring system. Something's wrong there because obviously the room, the length of the room is not changing. Something is, uh, something is erroneous there. But also, measurements must involve the right equipment. Okay, if I'm going to be measuring the length of a room, something on the scale of 10 meters, I'm not going to be using a ruler. Okay, I'm not going to be using a ruler. That's, that's an inappropriate piece of equipment for the task at hand. So selecting the right equipment to make measurements is the first step to reducing errors in an experiment. For example, you think about a beaker, a burette, or a graduated cylinder. These are things, these are three instruments that all measure volume, but on different scales, okay, on different scales. Uh, beakers, uh, compared to these other two, are going to, uh, beakers are going to measure larger volumes. A burette, a much smaller volume. For example, um, if I'm going to measure something fairly small, like 8.6 milliliters, I'm going to use a burette because I'm able to look at those smaller volumes with a lot more uh, precision. The burette allows you to volume, uh, sorry, measure a volume of liquid that is as close to 6.8 milliliters as possible. Um, if a procedure calls for you to measure 98 milliliters, you would use the graduated cylinder. And so I'm going to use these different instruments based on the scale the scale on which I'm measuring this volume. Now getting into one of our first uh, objectives here. When scientists make and report measurements, one factor that they consider is this thing called accuracy. The accuracy of a measurement is how close the measurement is to the true or actual value. Now outside of the scientist's understanding or outside of the scientist's knowledge, there is a true measurement if I'm measuring the length of the side of this room yes there in reality the there is a length that is the most accurate the most true value for the length of that room now if my measurement is accurate or the extent to which my measurement is accurate is the extent to which my measurement matches that true or actual value so uh, suppose the procedure for a uh, particular chemical reaction calls for adding 36 milliliters of a particular solution, right? 36 milliliters. The experiment is done twice. The first time, 35.8 milliliters is added. Second time, 37.2 milliliters is added. Because, you know, human error, we can't always be uh, over the top exact, especially uh, in this setting. Our lab, uh, our lab procedures aren't up to snuff yet our skills hopefully will improve but the first measurement okay the 35.8 milliliters is more accurate because it's closer to that true value of 36 okay it's closer to that true value of 36 if i were to grade you on your lab skills based on how close you were able to actually measure out 
36 milliliters, and one student uh, measured out 35.8 milliliters, the other measured out 37.2 milliliters, I would, I would uh, give a higher grade to the student that measured the 35.8 because it's closer to the 36, right? It's closer to that goal. 37.2 is uh, a little bit further away from that true statement. Another factor that scientists consider when making measurements is precision, okay, precision. Precision is the exactness, the exactness of a measurement. Now, a lot of people confuse this with accuracy. Let's, let's get into this description here. It refers to how closely several, okay, multiple measurements of the same quantity made in the same way can agree, okay, how they can agree. To understand how precision differs from accuracy, let's consider darts landing on a door, or sorry, a dartboard. Accuracy is the closeness of measurements to the correct or accepted value of the quantity measured. Precision is the closeness of a set of measurements of the same quantity made in the same way. Consider a game of darts. The target or accepted value is the bullseye in the center. The person who threw these darts is both precise and accurate. All the darts are grouped very close to the bullseye. This graph shows the results of an experiment that was repeated four times. Each time the mass and volume of the product were measured. We see that these results are both precise and accurate. They are clustered and very close to the expected value. This set of throws shows that the dart thrower is precise but not accurate. The darts are grouped very close together, but they have missed the bullseye. Here are the results of another researcher's experiments. These results are precise. The data points are clustered close together, but not accurate. Each of these darts landed reasonably close to the bullseye, but the throws are not clustered together and are not precise. In this experiment, the results would average to a value close to the expected value, so they could be considered accurate. They are not, however, precise. Here we have a set of throws that are neither clustered together nor very close to the target. This set of throws is not precise and not accurate. These experimental results, likewise, are not precise and not accurate. When looking at experimental data, precision lets us know the experiment was done carefully in a controlled environment. Accuracy suggests that the experiment has accounted for all factors that might affect the system being studied. So to recap, in your note packet you'll have this diagram, because uh, obviously you can't put a video in your PowerPoint notes, but this diagram will be in your notes so that you can refer to that idea again. And so when we have a tight grouping around the bullseye that's considered high accuracy and high precision. If I have a tight grouping but far from the bullseye that is high precision but low accuracy. If I have darts that are not tightly clustered and they are far from the bullseye that's considered low accuracy and low precision. Moving on to our second objective for today identifying significant figures. Now this is going to be a huge idea for you um, throughout the rest of this course because um, we do consider significant figures uh, throughout the course. Um, we don't hammer on it, but we do consider it. I like to make sure that you guys are aware that significant figures do play a role in our calculations. If you're interested in taking AP Chemistry, however, this is going to become a big part of your life as we try to prep moving towards the AP exam. So when you make measurements or perform calculations, the way you report a value tells about how you got it. Scientists report values using significant figures. Significant figures, or at least the significant figures of a measurement or a calculation, consist of all digits known with certainty. Okay, Known with certainty, for sure. So all the digits known with certainty, as well as one, estimated or uncertain digit. So every digit that you know for sure plus one additional one at the very end that is estimated. And I'll show you what I mean by estimated here in a moment. 
The last digit or significant figure reported after the measurement is always considered uncertain or estimated. Okay, so let's take a look at what estimated means. So if I am taking this, this nail and I'm measuring it using a centimeter stick, we can see that, you know, lined up the, the head of the nail uh, with the zero marker and I have the, the, the tip right here and I'm trying to just use my eyeball and see how long this nail is. I can see that it's definitely uh, longer than six centimeters but shorter than seven centimeters. Beyond that, I can see that it is longer than 6.123. It's longer than 6.3 centimeters but not quite 6.4 centimeters, right? We can tell that it's somewhere here in the middle. And so I'm definitely going to report 6.3 because those digits are known with certainty. It is for sure 6.3 something. 6.3 something. It's not 6.4 because I can clearly see that it hasn't gotten to the 6.4 mark. And so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm sorry, it definitely hasn't got to the 6.4 mark, but it's clearly past the 6.3 mark. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to estimate the last digit, trying to get a little bit more information communicated to the reader. So if I really, really focus up, I'm going to see that it's about, the tip of the nail is about halfway between the 6.3 and the 6.4 markers. So I'm going to estimate that the length of this nail is 6.35 centimeters. 6.35 centimeters. Now, that is three significant figures. The 6, the 3, and the 5. I know the 6 and the 3 with certainty. The 5 is estimated. So, reporting all measurements in an experiment to the correct number of significant figures is necessary to be sure that the results are true. Imagine you're measuring temperature with a thermometer calibrated to a one-tenth degree increment. For reading a temperature of 36.5 degrees Celsius, okay, which is nice and hot, um, the three digits in the value are all significant. Okay, all significant. The first two digits are known with certainty while the last is estimated. Just like in the uh, nail length example, the six and the three were known with certainty while the five was estimated. Now, in my nail example, it was 6.35, and with this temperature example, it's 36.5. You don't always have to estimate that, that it's a 0.5. Okay, that's just a coincidence that these two values are both 0.5. Um, also, it does not matter where you are in relation to that decimal point. Again, my first example was 6.35. This time it's 36.5. That doesn't uh, factor into how many significant figures you have until we start dealing, you know, asking ourselves about zeros, about zeros. And uh, we will consider that uh, in a bit. So in terms of figuring out if, uh, sorry, if you generate a measurement, if you actually measure something, okay, th that's kind of easy to tell how many significant figures you have, right? Every digit that you know with certainty plus one estimated digit. But if you're not actually carrying out that measurement, you're just looking at a measurement that someone has given you, you still need to be able to uh, figure out how many significant figures are present, okay, the precision with which that measurement was carried out. And so here are the rules that you're going to use for determining the number of significant figures, okay? Now, as you work on sample problems, as you work on your worksheet, as you work on your preparation problems, as you practice or prepare for the quick write and the quiz, you need to have your notes open to this slide to get used to these rules. Now, you, eventually you're going to have to have these memorized. You're going to have to be able to uh, determine the number of significant figures off the top of your head, but, but not right this instant. So have your notes open to this slide. Number one, non-zero digits, non-zeros. Okay, it's so like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're always significant. If you see them written down, they are significant. Those are easy. But when we get into zeros, we have, we have a few more rules to consider. Zeros between any non-zero digits are significant, right? So these are, these are considered significant. So 
So if I have like uh, 1,009, right? 1,009. Those sandwiched zeros in there are considered significant. Number three, zeros in front of non-zero digits are not significant. So if I have 0 0.09, that 9 is significant because it's a non-zero digit, but the zero to the left or in front of the 9 is not considered significant because it's simply being a placeholder. Number four, this is the only time we get a little bit tricky, uh, but here we go. Number four, trailing zeros are only significant if there is a decimal present in the number. doesn't matter where the decimal is, but if there's a decimal in that number, any trailing zeros are, or after any non-zero digits are considered significant. But those trailing zeros are not significant if there is no decimal in the number. Again, doesn't matter where. The question is, is there a decimal present in the number? Having a decimal will make your trailing zeros significant. Not having a decimal will make your trailing zeros not significant. All right, chemistry, that's going to do it for part one of your video lecture for chapter two, section three. I will see you next period.